Uh, so I'm uh, Nidhan Agarwal and I run a lab called uh, Collaboratorium for Social Media and Online Behavioral Studies uh, that stands for COSMOS. And at COSMOS, we have several research projects uh, that set the full spectrum of online behaviors. I categorize them as good, bad, and the ugly. So it's interesting because I think Ross timed it perfectly. This talk is just the day after the web turned 30. So you're kind of in this uh, weird hangover party. You're bashing the internet. We're saying all the nasty things about it. Uh, but there are also a lot of good things. Because social media is largely considered as a positive vehicle of change. We have seen that during socio-political transformations in Arab Spring, where autocratic societies were converted to democratic systems. And there are so many other uh, positive behaviors that we have seen. I'm sorry. So that, uh, whether it is the expression of solidarity and support towards gender biased laws and practice in Saudi Arabia where females were not allowed to drive, but last summer that got over, so they are not allowed to drive. Whether it is the Me Too movement and so on, urban planning, using social media data for, uh, for, for smart living, for healthy living, for policy and decision making and so on. But recently, we have seen a surge in negative behaviors or in deviant behaviors. Right. So whether uh, we have seen things like uh, weaponization of information, uh, rise of radical and extremist groups like ISIS and their use of internet for uh, disseminating propaganda, for recruiting and radicalization campaigns, uh, misinformation, fake news, which is almost every day on the news, splashes, covers and magazines, so on and more. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is we'll discuss uh, the work that we are doing at Cosmos specifically in the misinformation, disinformation, and deviant behaviors. But we have several projects in health informatics uh, in, in, in understanding how behaviors evolve, how flash mobs take place, and just how social movements organize, mobilize, and, and, and uh, create support. So a lot of things are going on at Cosmos uh, as, as pertains to social media. So if you're interested in knowing more about this project and several other projects, just go to cosmos.ulr.edu. Right. So I'll do uh, one thing, I'll, I'll just go over a brief agenda what we have planned for tonight. I'll start with a little history where this all stems from and then what type of misinformation campaigns we have seen, uh, not in just political or security sphere, but also various aspects of life, whether it is medical domain, whether it is agriculture, whether it is uh, just plain entertainment and so on. And then we'll take a look at some real physical deathly consequences of deviant mobs that start out as viral rumors and then have real serious con consequences. Then take a look at some cases of misinformation in various domains and how they evolve with the advent of the artificial intelligence, which is known as computational propaganda techniques. So we'll take a look at some of those things. More importantly, we'll also spend time on why this is going on and what is the motivation behind doing all these things. Uh, we have seen several news articles and reports, so we can pinpoint some things, but I'm going to crystallize several motivations behind these operations, behind these cyber operations or information operations are largely categorized as information or cyber warfare. Now I'll try to uh, touch upon very briefly uh, on the various aspects, various things that we are working on uh, in, in Cosmos uh, pertaining to monitoring these campaigns, how we are helping NATO and some of the, our upcoming uh, uh, efforts on helping US Army Central Command in knowing what's going on in social media space when they monitor extremist groups, when they conduct exercises, what type of things are going on. Right? So I'll spend some time over there. And then towards the end I'll conclude with some additional readings, resources, since it's a lecture, it will not be a good thing for me to leave you guys without some homework assignments. So there will be some reading assignments, not assignment, but reading materials, and guidelines and some recommendations. So I get started. Our popular understanding of mobs can be traced back at least a century old. Right? There is this work by uh, Gustave Le Bon <coughs> And he uh, published his work in a book called The Crowd, a uh, study of popular mining, 1895. And I'm just going to read some excerpts uh, what he had said. He largely expressed uh, skepticism uh, when the, 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 the lifestyle was shifting from agrarian society to city living. He mentioned um, urban crowd is marked by impulsiveness, irritability, incapacity to reason, and exaggeration of sentiments. 
A man on his own can be cultivated individual, but in a crowd he's a barbarian. Sound familiar? Right? Can we say the same for internet behaviors? Right? As we are, so our fears of how um, our behaviors are evolving when we are moving from real life, real world to virtual world to the internet world. Our fears of how those behaviors are evolving and how they will shape up are very well justified. Okay? Social media can be organized, can be used to organize individuals into groups, groups into crowds, and crowds into mobs very quickly. Okay, we have seen cases, numerous cases, and these are the reports uh, just from India, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, where just a viral rumor was spread on platforms like WhatsApp, um, and through that, a group of individuals were targeted. Many times these were marginalized or minority communities. They were targeted to the point that they were beaten to death. Okay, so these are some of the cases that I have highlighted here. So you can imagine uh, that the countries are sort of tinderbox and Facebook and all these are just match, match boxes. You can just light it up and then there you go, boom. Social media also provides a platform for many of the fringe ideas. These are not new ideas that we are seeing nowadays. These have been there, but so, what social media has done is it has provided a platform, sort of a springboard, where all these fringe ideas now are becoming mainstream, or at least they look like they are mainstream. Because something called uh, echo chamber or a filter bubble, where you see things which you like more, and then these social media platforms keep recommend you, recommending you stuff that you like. So you sort of build a filter bubble around yourself. Okay? So the fringe ideas previously that were in the pockets of societies, they now appear to be more mainstream. Okay? These groups can then spread uh, misinformation, can spread rumors, and with the, the speed of the internet, they spread like wildfire. You can really imagine that uh, these things are wildfire on steroids. So are these groups, right? So we have seen vicious mobs. There are terrorist extremist groups, okay, who conduct operations on internet using social media platforms. There are hacker networks that launch cyber war, cyber warfare. There are several propaganda groups. We have studied uh, immensely anti-NATO propaganda groups. And of course, internet trolls. So these are all different types of groups. What is common to these groups? They use internet to organize their activities. All right, we all know that. And another behavior that all of them exhibit is they use internet to hide. They conduct an operation and they hide into the anonymity of the internet. They conduct these operations very sophisticatedly. Okay, they use all these platforms, they organize very well, conduct that operation and then disperse into the anonymity of the internet. Does that sound familiar? Have you guys seen something like a flash mob? Right? These are entertaining mobs, entertaining crowds, group of people who gather at a place, conduct that event, okay, and then they disperse into the crowd. Same behavior now we are observing on internet. We call them cyber flash mobs. And more specifically, when we reflect, when we model these deviant behaviors, we call them deviant cyber flash mobs. It's a mouthful. But this is how you can observe the real world phenomena taking shape onto the virtual world, onto the internet, right? And there are numerous theories, theoretical backgrounds in social science, uh, which can be now leveraged to explain this behavior, to model this behavior, and then predict the outcomes of such behaviors. So our research focuses on many of those theoretical backgrounds, and then try to bring in the data from computational uh, side, which is the social media data. And we have mathematical models which we use to then uh, develop understanding of these behaviors and then be able to predict these behaviors. Now I'm going to go over some of the cases of misinformation. All right, uh, misinformation is rampant; it's everywhere, and often uh, in online sphere, in, in, in internet, what happens is there is a meme that takes birth. How many of you know or seen a meme? What a meme is. So these are images that go wild and they are very uh, 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 creative, crafty and humorous images uh, like this one. Right? I have an immune system, no vaccines needed. Right? So if you have seen Matrix the movie and this guy, uh, the main lead character Neo is sort of an all-powerful guy. Okay? The funny thing about this uh, meme is 
that the, this type of meme circulates a lot in the anti-vaccination communities. Okay? Those who refuse to administer vaccines to the kids or to themselves. The funny thing about this meme is actually the character Neo, he had to choose between red and blue pill in the, in the movie. So he had to take pills, so he's not all immune. Right? Now when you look at internet, specifically Twitter, you'll notice this is what uh, we have found. There are several groups, specifically uh, anti-vaccination groups and autism uh, awareness groups who have uh, 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 debated vigorously that there is a need for vaccination as opposed to the anti-vaccination community who is always arguing against vaccination. So these two clusters of individuals on are very tightly connected. I mean, there's a lot of exchange back and forth between these two groups. Okay. Another thing to notice here is the anti-vaccination group on the, on the left, if you look at the size of that group, it's quite comparable to the autism group. That tells you a lot that there is a very active and vigorous community on the internet that is advocating for uh, no vaccination, trying to uh, discourage vaccination. This phenomena is so prevalent that there is a term assigned for this. It's called misinfodemics. Misinfodemic. So it's a play of word, right? Uh, yeah. So a an epidemic that is caused or artificially launched because of misinformation that is out there. Now there's just so much activity here, although there have been efforts by Facebook, by YouTube, by Pinterest, who are squashing these pages, or squashing these groups, demonetizing activities of these groups, but still there's just so much of data on the internet about these groups that the recommendation algorithms that recommend you content, they are biased. You search for vaccination, you keep watching videos in progression as YouTube recommends you, very soon you will find yourself in conspiracy theory videos. Okay. So these groups are being able to exploit the algorithmic biases that are there in the social media uh, organizations, the, the, the content recommendation algorithms they're using, they're be able to use the biases among those and so on. This effort has also been very successful. So the anti-vaccination group's effort has been quite successful. When you look at the statistics by CDC, by European uh, Red Cross societies, you'll notice, for example, in the left, the CDC numbers tell us that there were 206 cases in January and February of this year alone that already surpass annual totals for most of the past decades, cases of rising measles. If you look at Europe, 2018 last year, there's just a spike in number of measles cases that have been reported. And the statement from the regional director of the IFRC Europe says um, the vaccine refusal an increasingly worrying trend. So basically that is the main cause behind these uh, reportings. Another uh, <coughs> misinformation, right? Dr. Google is a liar. So how many of us are Dr. Googles? So this is a phenomenon when we self-diagnose and we assume the worst symptom, worst diagnosis possible. So either we fall prey to that or we fall prey to the misinformation, either one of those. Right, and there have been many such cases. Very recently there have been groups that are discouraging the use of statins that lower the, the, the cholesterol, uh, the heart healthy drug, um, because it causes cancer. This is an unfounded claim, unbased uh, claim, no scientific evidence is there to support that claim. So statins cause cancer. So which basically leading people who would be taking statins to be more cautious uh, to not to take or discouraged to take statins. Another one which is more about health and well, uh, wellness is the pink salt, okay? How many of you have heard of pink salt or use pink salt? Right. So the sales of pink salt over the last nine years have grown tremendously. Trader Joe, who used to keep these products for just few uh, months, just to try out basis, they have been considered keeping pink salt for nine years. That's a record for Trader Joe, for any new novelty type product. All because of there is a lot of uh, misinformation on the internet that pink salt is a healthier alternative than regular salt. And there is no scientific claim to that. There is no sign. The only thing is it looks prettier than white salt, the pink salt, yeah. And there is ton of such information out there on internet about 
things that do not make sense, but then people are following and they're falling prey to that type of uh, misinformation. Misinformation agriculture. Arkansas is an agriculture state. Now this is uh, very interesting. Why? Because there have been reports, uh, numerous reports, that um, genetically modified pro uh, pro uh, produce uh, can cause obesity, can cause type 2 diabetes, autism, and so many other diseases. Again, no scientific claim, but what was interesting about these uh, reports was the groups, the Twitter groups that were promoting this message, where that were promoting this misinformation were tied to some of those same agencies that Mueller's report had pointed out. So that is interesting. Why? What is the reason behind doing this? Right? Now, if you look at many of these issues, what we have seen and others have also reported, many of these issues are highly divisive issues inside, highly polarizing issues. So what it does is basically all these Russian information actors or pro-Russian information actors take these divisive issues and then try to split the communities, split the discourse, polarize the discourse so as they can sow discord in the societies and create havoc, create hysteria create chaos society. Right? So it's not just one issue, there are uh, many issues which are uh, sensitive to the, to the societies and they try to just uh, uh, keep charging up the communities. And later in a few slides I'll show what we have seen in one such issue. Misinformation disasters. Right? So if you've uh, followed flood tweets and you may have seen these sharks floating, floating on freeways. That's a very common hoax. Uh, it's not, there is no propaganda, there is no agenda behind that. This is just an innocent entertaining, uh, entertaining hoax. But this, the same shark has been swimming since 2005 <laughs> on freeways. All right. And when you go back further, you actually will find that this shark was actually a, a photograph taken by a geographic uh, in Africa, Africa Geographic Channel. And someone, uh, had the courage to crop it up and then show that uh, the, that shark floating around freeways in many of these uh, hurricanes, floods and so on. <laughs> what we did, um, we actually detected this in one of our studies when we were looking at bots on Twitter, automated accounts who spread messages on your behalf. Okay, So we detected bots were tweeting this and why would they do that? Of course, just for fun's sake. But then when we look at a time progression of how this shark hoax is doing, you can see that the interest is quickly rising. So the more recent uh, natural disasters have a lot more spikes on the interest of shark hoax. So people are more interested, what's going on? Why is there a shark near my neighborhood and so on? When we shared this finding with our DARPA program manager um, uh, who's funding our botnet study, uh, so he was so psyched that he asked us to do a full briefing uh, to their program. And now they have a separate program which is known as Quantitative Crisis Response, QCR, at DARPA. So we will be applying for that grant soon. Okay. Now that's not all. Okay, that's not all because all this is being done manually. All right. And uh, what we have also seen is this problem of misinformation is getting worse because creating these images, creating these shark hoax images manually takes time and effort, right? But can we do that automatically? The answer is yes, disturbingly yes. You can do that automatically. There are tools, the one on the, the left, extreme left, that's called fake text tool. It's a, 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 a tool that is created by a company called OpenAI, Elon Musk, the Tesla owner, he's the major funder of that uh, company. What this tool does is, you just give a brief snippet of text, it'll generate a whole article. It'll generate a complete article. Very legitimate, very credible, very believable article. The second one on the, on the right is fake images. None of these individuals are real. All these six faces, they're not real. They're fake. They look real, right? You see where I'm going with this? Text, images. The third is video. This is my personal favorite. You will be amazed by how artificial intelligence technologies can do what they can do, the potential. Okay. This video actually shows how Obama has been promoting the, the Black Panthers movie. 
and has uh, really disparaging comments about uh, Pre President Trump. And this is completely fake. This is artificial. So Jordan Peele did the voiceover and they had the, the face of Obama and the lip movement sync up with that, completely done using artificial intelligence. If I did not had tell you this, you would not have been able to notice that if I showed you the video. By the way, Elon Musk uh, said that he's not going to release this software because this is just too dangerous to be released in public domain. Yeah. So this software is not in public domain, but you can see in action in videos how this can do things. Well, we know anything that you try to keep a lid on, on the internet, what happens? Right? It just gets out even more faster. So we'll see. Maybe there will be some copies floating around of that software sometime soon. So why are we doing this or why uh, these groups are doing this? What is the real reason behind this? You can basically categorize that into two, um, two ideas. One is to manipulate and the other is to monetize. <coughs> There's a real business incentive in doing that and I'll show you what. So uh, manipulation, the reason of such behavior is basically manipulation, many people trust, uh, their friend circle. So on Facebook, a uh, lot of folks get their news from Facebook, from uh, social media uh, platforms. Uh, Pew Research Center data survey in 2016 found 34% of Americans trust the information from social media. The things that show up on your news feed, okay? How does Facebook recommend you that? Based on what your friends have seen or what you have seen, what they have clicked, right? So again, you're creating a filter bubble around you. If your friends and you or your friends are alike, you keep seeing the same content again and again. The more repetitions or more impressions of such content exist, the more believable they get. Right? So believe in those content more. Okay. Monetization. These are staggering numbers. For $55,000, you could launch an information campaign to discredit a journalist. For $200,000, you can even instigate a street protest just using social media platforms. These are services on dot market. You pay them this much money in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all, all those. Right? And you can get this desired outcome. Okay. On the right, there is an image. Uh, this was a cover story by uh, Wired magazine a few months ago, right after, uh, uh, a few months after uh, US elections uh, in 2016. What was found was there is a small city in Macedonia. It's called Veles. A lot of teenagers in that city got rich really quick. The average income of teenagers there is 300 to 400 dollars for four or five months. Okay. They started making 16,000 dollars, 18,000, 20,000 dollars a month. To do what? To buy cars to impress girls. So what they were doing, what was the secret behind <laughs> making that much money? Right? They started hosting these fake blogs. Blogs that would have just so out, such an outrageous content that no one could believe that. But what was happening? They were creating these blogs, which was then pushed out on Facebook, on Twitter. People were watching. They were further resharing or retweeting, reposting, and that got them all the ad dollars, advertisement dollars, through Google, through Facebook. Okay. So imagine the amount of traffic that they were attracting to make that much money a month. And imagine the scale of operations they had. Okay, there were just hundreds and hundreds of such websites. In one of our projects, uh, which we are working on with NATO uh, up in the Baltic uh, states, we have detected over 10,000 fake blog sites, which we are still analyzing. And these blog sites get suspended, others get uh, back up. Right? So there is uh, this whack-a-mole approach. You kill one, it's done. That's not going to work. Yeah. If you kill one, there are hundreds more. So remember just a few uh, moments ago, I mentioned about uh, sowing, division in this, sowing division and discord in society. So hysteria propagation is another reason why these groups are doing what they're doing. Okay. Um, basic, basically the idea is to erode confidence in publicly and well-established institutions, scientific institutions, democrat, uh, democratic institutions, by just peddling out these conspiracy theories. This is a, a funny incidence. Uh, Sean Dawson, a very prominent YouTuber, released a 104-minute documentary. 
which just strung together a lot of uh, hypotheses. He calls them hypotheses, and these are outright conspiracy theories. Some of them I have listed here. The first one is popular children's television shows contain subliminal messages urging children to commit suicide. Okay, yeah. Recent string of deadly wildfires in California was set on purpose uh, to collect insurance by homeowners or to test directed energy weapons by the military. I know, just crazy bizarre. Third one is my personal favorite. Chuck E. Cheese recycles customers uneaten pizza. Right? It slices into new pizzas. Now think about it. That's <laughs> <laughs> so you fall for that, huh? you fall for that. Now, so this is so bizarre, but it is uh, also uh, uh, tells you that how profound uh, these operations are. Chuck E. Cheese had to come out and discredit this claim. They had to issue a statement on Twitter that this is not true, because that was that had started affecting their business. And when you look at the video, why? Because look at this, just in one month, 30 million views. And among all the videos of this YouTuber, this was the highest. He does not even have that much following. So imagine how conspiracy theories are traveling faster than any other information, right? So there's, there's a saying, right? The truth uh, spins around the world twice as fast and the, the truth doesn't even get a chance to wear its pants. So. Oh, another reason why uh, these groups are doing what they're doing, radicalization recruitment, right? We have seen ISIS and several other extremist groups, terrorist organizations who have used internet to their advantage and very skillfully, right? very skillfully. Uh, so we conducted uh, research on ISIS social media networks. Uh, I had to uh, take off some names uh, from, this, uh, from this graph. But in the center, uh, on the left image, you see those uh, big dots, colorful dots. Those are uh, ISIS super recruiters on Twitter. These are the ones who are actively going out and recruiting folks, spreading propaganda, uh, videos of beheading, and using those to recruit new young folks to join their cause. When we were able to dig up their metadata using some cyber forensic techniques, we look at, looked at the locations, the geolocations, which is on the right. right? Geolocations of these uh, super spreaders or super uh, recruiters. The ones that have this big marker, the red markers, are the ones who are super recruiters. The other tiny green ones are sort of their followers, but still very important followers who have a lot of following. Now you have noticed. Uh, some of you have noticed this bizarre thing. Up in the Greenland, who is tweeting from Greenland, middle of Greenland? Right? That's bizarre. Who does that? It turns out there's no one there, right? So it's, it's really, it's not like there is an ISIS uh, sympathizer who is there. No. This is basically they're using advanced technologies to spoof their location, to masquerade their location, to portray that they are from Greenland or to portray from some other countries while they were actually apprehended in different part of the world. So think about it, they are so technically savvy, they are able to use social media to their advantage and they are also able to spoof their location. We shared these findings with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, a wing of NSA. Guess what happened? A few months, of, sorry, a few weeks later, much of that network was shut down. So well, somehow Twitter got that word and they suspended many of these accounts. So after a few, uh, few months, we reanalyzed the network and this is what we found. The ones on the left, the red ones, are still active. The ones on the right are suspended. But further, when we looked at their network, they were even more actively recruiting. Yes, Twitter shut down almost half of their network at that time. But six months later, the same five folks who were still active, they were able to recruit twice as fast. Okay, so again, Whack-a-mole approach does not work. It is a good first step, but it does not work. It is not adequate. There needs to be. What makes these misinformation campaigns so successful? Okay, so you want to know what makes these campaigns so successful. Uh, there are two uh, main uh, answers so far that we have. The first one is their massive cross-media dissemination campaign. They leverage a lot of social media platforms to their advantage. It is not just on blogs. It is not just on Twitter or Facebook. The way it works is underneath, underneath these figures, the bottom part of the slide. The underbellies of the internet, 4chan, 
uh, Reddit. These are the places where memes are generated. Those funny images, those are generated. And um, they are widely spread using um, other platforms. So once you have these memes from these meme factories, they are carefully crafted into news articles, into blog posts, uh, using video blogging or vlogging on YouTube and other WordPress live general style uh, uh, blog sites. And then once the payload is prepared, then this is delivered to the targeted communities using Facebook, using Twitter, using WhatsApp, using even newer platforms like Gab, Discord, Pokemon. Like these are all gaming communities. So think about it, why they are targeting gaming communities to recruit to get impressionable minds to young minds. Okay. But you must be wondering why blogs, right? What is so special about blogs? Why start with blogs? Right? Why not just directly pump data on Twitter, on Facebook? Right? Why to have this two-phase strategy? The reason is uh, blogs are decentralized. There is no control, there's no regulation on blogs. You cannot suspend accounts. There's no character limit. Right? They act as virtual town halls. The article is there, the commentary is there, and they just start disseminating that and drive traffic, drive eyeballs towards blogs. Okay. On Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you can flag a content and get suspended. On blogs, there is no such authority. It means I can run a blog from my, uh, from, from my garage. I can run a blog from anywhere. Nobody cares. In fact, uh, just a few minutes ago when I mentioned about the uh, the 10,000 list, uh, 10,000 uh, website list from the Baltic for fake news. We analyzed systematically each and every one of those and saw how they are trying to disseminate content. And this is just one instance of that, where a blog article right in the center is being disseminated on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, and many other such platforms. These findings have been published in the NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence as a book called Digital Hydra. You cut one head, there are few more heads, right? Yeah, so that's the concept, Digital Hydra, and then NATO Stratcom uh, uh, Defense Strategic Communications Journal. Okay. Well, our ongoing efforts include actively tracking anti-West, anti-European Union, and anti-NATO propaganda, all the foreign-based propaganda that is hitting us. And we have participated in various NATO exercises to assist public affairs officers, social media monitoring campaigns. Um, some of these exercises, I have included their logos here, uh, Dragoon Ride in 2015, all the way up to just uh, recently concluded in last year in November, Trident Juncture 2018, which is their flagship uh, exercise involving over 30,000 troops and equipment that moves along various countries in Europe. And of course, uh, America participates um, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of military movement uh, right along the, the the Russian borders and the the, the Russian uh, uh, international waters that border with uh, Russian waters also. And um, this one, the one uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about the Trident Juncture, was conducted in um, Scandinavian region, mainly Norway. And uh, we'll, I'll tell you what we have found and what we uh, discovered there. Uh, but I also showed you that we have monitored groups like ISIS, uh, uh, previous events like Russian invasion of Crimean uh, Peninsula, and we are currently working with the US Army Central Command for their upcoming exercises in Middle East. So basically we have this methodology, uh, and I'll show you the tools that we are using and what we have found. We use that methodology to, uh, to collect data, to analyze what's going on, and then uh, go back to these uh, analysts, to, um, to the public affairs officers, uh, who can then help us understand what's going on and then we can help them. Much of the findings that I'm going to show you uh, next are, pub are going to be published this month in the NATO Joint Warfare Center's uh, flagship magazine called Three Swords. Uh, so our article is going to be the cover story on that, which is the NATO integrates new media, but so do the adversaries. Okay, so what we have found, how uh, NATO can uh, uh, refine or retune their social media strategy based on uh, the findings that we have had and several other teams uh, who are working with us on this uh, on this effort. The technology that we have used for uh, studying these exercises are uh, blog trackers and YouTube trackers. Both of these are developed in-house um, in our Cosmos lab in UNREIT and they are helping us monitoring blogs and YouTube and various other content. You must be wondering, why not Twitter? 
Twitter, why not Facebook? So what we have is we have a collection of teams who are working uh, on this aspect. So we are focusing on blogs and YouTube while there are other teams, uh, total five teams spread across Canada, US and Europe uh, who are working on other technologies, other social media platforms. But towards the end, we share our findings with each other, we share data with each other, we share research with each other so that it's not just siloed work, it is highly collaborative in nature. This is an overall methodology. I have compressed a lot of information, seven months of hard work and hard <coughs> labor, sleepless nights. I know some cosmographers are here, uh, so they look tired. <laughs> so we have, uh, I have tried to compress all of that information here, but very, very uh, um, 40,000 uh, feet view. This was done longitudinally. We had seven months of rigorous data collection, processing, analysis, and reporting out. So the battle rhythm for these exercises were uh, we would conduct the analysis in the morning, share the findings in the evening, we go to bed, yes, we sleep, and then in the next morning we come back with their questions or RFIs, requests for more information. So the time difference between us and Norway was actually helping us in that sense. When they were sleeping, we were working, when we were sleeping, they were working. So the way this worked was we set up the, uh, the data collection methodology in three phases. The first phase was uh, to train ourselves, what are we looking for? Okay, so we uh, did a NATO outreach. We wanted to know what type of information actors, what type of sources they would like to monitor, what are the keywords, and so on. Once we got that, we started our data collection sprints. Two sprints were run in the second phase for two weeks each. The first data collection gave us a lot of information, but also highlighted the, the shortcomings, the limitations we had, where we were failing in identifying sources or not being able to collect right data. Data collection two sprint, took all that feedback and then we were able to collect more refined data. And then the third phase, which was just uh, during the live ex, the live exercise, we were able to revalidate our methodologies to recalibrate them, okay, what we need to change. And then we ran uh, the data collection to collect all the data that I have listed down here. For YouTube, we were able to collect 170,000 videos, 4 million comments. For blogs, we were able to collect a lot of blogs, but these are the ones that were most uh, disseminated or most relevant close to uh, 420 blogs, which are coming from subject matter expertise, uh, keyword based search, uh, geofence data collection, which was several geofences were set up on Twitter to identify who is spreading what from which region and those were used to pick up uh, URLs that were disseminated in that area a lot. Facebook and other analysts. So all these data streams that were coming in from other teams, from other sources were pulled in, we extracted, parsed out all the blog sites, all the YouTube links and then analyzed. Right? So it looks simple, right? It looks trivial, but there was a lot of hard work that has gone inside uh, and into this. This uh, pie chart gives you a brief idea of uh, the language distributions we had uh, during these exercises, uh, during uh, from this data. Clearly, Hungarian, English, Romanian, Norwegian were leading languages, but there were some other European uh, languages as well. This is just a, a posting trend from blogs. We noticed that. Um, there was an increase in how the blogs were generated, posted right before the exercise, and that stayed almost constant. So there was an increased activity on blogs. There was a lot more activity on our Twitter and Facebook. Um, the topics changed, and the leading keywords that were being used in these blogs were war and NATO, and those mentions spiked right before the exercise and then continued to be the same during the exercise. Meaning what they were suggesting was NATO is provoking Russia into a war. Those was, that was the, the leading narrative of all these anti-NATO blogs. Some of the influential blog posts that we identified had uh, stop NATO, anti-NATO movement narratives. Uh, NATO is uh, dangerous to the environment. It is affecting the environment. All these exercises are, are damaging environments. So they're not he uh, helpful. Um, military exercise do not make peace, so it's not going to help in security and peace of the region, it's going to just destabilize. So there are many other narratives, I'm going to show that. But before I go there, I want to highlight this case study. What happened was, this was not part of Trident, uh, Trident Juncture 2018, but a previous exercise. And we identified this interesting vlogger, a video blogger, who became an instant internet celebrity in Ukraine during one of those exercises. And what had happened was basically he would take a video camera, he would go to the street, he'd start live shooting and then make a, a video. He was 
basically saying that the previous pro-Russian Ukrainian government uh, was, was a good government. Ukrainians are happy with that, which was completely opposite what the reality was. Okay. So he had a lot of pro-Russian propaganda in these videos. Now, when we were analyzing a blog data set, we identified this, uh, this blog, the blog that this, this person was writing as uh, one of the most influential blogs. And that jumped at us that why RT and all these other uh, famous uh, and well-established websites are not as popular as this guy. We shared this finding. We did not know what's going on in Ukraine. We were here. We shared these findings with our uh, NATO liaison officer, US Army officer who was stationed at NATO at that time. So we shared that those findings with him and his jaw literally dropped. He said that, Nitin, how are you able to find this? Why, why have you, what is so special about this guy? Like, how are you able to find this? And now we are surprised that why is, this, what is going on with this guy? Like, why are you so surprised? Means this is just a finding from one of our models. And then he told us, okay, so he didn't tell us before because he didn't want our analysis to be biased. He said that this guy has been suspended or he's been banned from Ukraine. His equipments have been seized. He is now in Russia. He's blogging uh, from Russia. Okay. So he was so psyched with our findings that now he's doing PhD, he's pursuing his doctorate degree with us in our program. He was so psyched with our uh, uh, tools and technology. And by the way, he's also one of the co-authors on the paper that I showed you earlier, the Three Sword Magazine article. So all the other leading narratives uh, that we uh, found during these exercises, of course, environmental impact, uh, disturb the local economy, mistreatment by NATO troops, uh, NATO is a joke, mocking or ridiculing NATO, and so on. NATO spoke in Russian bear. Some of the anti-NATO imageries, images that were disseminated were there. Now, interesting thing was we also observed one of these images, right, which was uh, an anti-refugee sentiment. And the interesting, more interesting thing about this was we had detected this image back in 2015, which was recirculating in 2018. Basically, the same thing. It's an issue that is sensitive in Europe. So they're trying to use the issue, trying to use those issues that are highly divisive to sow discord in the society. Whether it is NATO, anti-NATO propaganda or not, the idea is just to dis sow discord in the society, to polarize the discussion. Okay. So this uh, content was still, again, reused and resurfacing on these blog sites. From YouTube, the story was much different because YouTube gives us a lot more uh, interesting uh, data in terms of metadata and so on. So there we were able to find out the location of these uh, sources. Most of the content was published from the United States. There were other countries, including Russia, Germany, United Kingdom, Ukraine, Netherlands, and other European countries that were disseminating the content. Most of the content was coming from US. However, the Russian content was mostly hostile. Not surprising though. The Russian content was mostly, uh, mostly hostile. When you look at the target audience, of these videos, who are they targeting, who are these groups targeting. Mainly English speaking communities, Norwegian speaking communities, Russian, German, Spanish, and so on. We look at the sentiment analysis, mostly negative, significantly negative sentiments were found during the exercise period. And then this was hap this happened. As this exercise was wrapping up, this is November 8th, think. The exercise is wrapping up by November 6th and 7th, and this is November 8th. People were packing bags, they were just about to go, they were tired of this exercise, and this thing happens. This is a collision between a Norwegian frigate and an oil tanker. Okay? And then, so this was an embarrassing moment for Norwegian um, military as well as uh, the entire exercise. Although this was not a part of the exercise, this was after the exercise, but then Russians had their field day. So all these memes, all these images start popping up everywhere on Twitter, on Russian Facebook, the We Contact tape, and so on. YouTube, blogs. And not just that, when we did cyber forensic analysis of these blogs, we actually found that there is a massive cross-media dis dissemination. So this content was being circulated on Instagram, on Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, Google+, all the major players. And this is not enough. Okay. So if you thought that misinformation, that's, that's mean no. So one of the success, one of the reasons why this, the, these campaigns are so successful is cross-media. The other is 
these automated accounts, okay, robotic accounts. These are also part of computational propaganda techniques. These are known as machine driven communications or mad comms. Bots, social bots, bot nets, all are part of that. So basically this is computer engineered story push. These bots who can tweet or who can retweet on your behalf are easy to program and for a non-programmer you don't even have to do anything. You can just go on the internet and buy these accounts. So these are some uh, numbers here. So you can get huge bot pack that includes Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and much more for just under six dollars. That's not even a large cup of coffee. right? So you can get all these uh, bots to do whatever you want. You can get 2,000 high quality Twitter retweets for six dollars thirty cents. 2,000 high quality uh, US Twitter uh, likes for I don't know six dollars or so. Right. So these bots are for sale. So anyone can buy these bots and you can have a huge fan following. So your Twitter account next day could have 2,000 followers, 3,000 followers. Again, what these bots are doing is the same thing. Take an issue that divides the society, go to both these discourse communities and start charging them up. Okay. So this was an issue that we tracked uh, on um, the, the, the NFL controversy that happened with Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and then uh, whether we should take a knee or we should go with the, the, the national anthem, we should stand. So these two communities on the uh, bottom left, bottom right corner were each one taking a different stance and the orange dots inside these are the bots. So bots are found both these places, both these are not just this or that. They were in both these communities in the charging of the discourse to basically just sow discord and divide the community, polarize and divide. Now you may ask, okay, so if you have detected these bots, so just suspend them, right? Just kill these bots and it should be all over. So first we have seen that whack-a-mole approach doesn't work, right? You kill one, there are so many more. The second, we also know that they're going to get more sophisticated and we actually have seen this. The bot behaviors, bots itself, themselves are getting more and more sophisticated. This is a five year study that we conducted, started so in 2014 and still going on. Um, in fact, just before this one, we had a research meeting on botnets and how they're evolving. So what we found was initially in 2014, back in 20, these bots were very, very primitive. You find one, you can find the entire cluster, you yank them out. Later years, more recent years, these bots are becoming so sophisticated that there is an organizational structure. There is like a president bot, there is a master bot, there are uh, peripheral bots. So yeah, so there's these, these structures are getting more and more sophisticated. There is a well-defined hierarchy of these bots. They are behaving more like humans. So it's getting more and more difficult to suspend or identify these bots. These bots are not just localized to Twitter. We have also detected bots on YouTube. So ours is the first group who has actually detected bots on YouTube. And uh, these findings have been published. So what has happened is again, I'm just showing the tip of the iceberg. It took days and days of analysis of YouTube data. Imagine millions of comments coming in and we have to process all these, build these networks and then identify these bots. So days, sometimes even weeks to analyze this data to get these groups of commenters who would just go to a video and then start commenting rapidly. All right? So in, in, in a way they are trying to just boost the engagement scores of that video, artificially boost. So it will look like there are more views, look like there are more likes, there are more comments. So what does YouTube do? As soon as YouTube sees these things, oh this video is viral, let me show this video to every other one. All right? So your recommended video, related video stream starts seeing, you start seeing all these videos again. So basically what they're doing is gaming or manipulating YouTube's recommendation algorithms to let you to believe that this is a viral content and then keep showing that in numerous streams. There's an article called YouTube the Great Radicalizer. They actually conducted, uh, the author actually conducted an experiment. You click on a conspiracy theory video, the related, related videos are even more entrenched in those deeper conspiracies. So it's basically it's a rabbit hole, keep going deep and down and down. This strategy was successful. We detected those bots <coughs> during our trial and juncture exercise. This strategy was so successful that even after the exercise, the top most watched video was the collision video and not any of the other videos that were going on during the NATO exercise. Even NATO's official channel published several videos. Those videos didn't get that much traction 
than this video. Okay. And when you look at some of the comments, they are highly offensive to NATO, mocking or ridiculing tones. This is actually a business. You can buy views, likes, comments, and there are several businesses who do that. The same thing is with blogs. There are several uh, such robotic blog forms that are there that we have detected. This one is in particular very interesting because this spreads into Ukraine and Russia. Okay, And many of the blog sites, the clone sites that have been established have links to money laundering services. Okay, So the idea behind this is you have a master blog, push a content, all these clone blog sites will replicate that content and then search engines will think, oh, this is a viral content, let me show that first. So this way they can game search engines or manipulate their rankings. Okay. Which we have actually seen in one of these uh, instances where a Swedish television mask was destroyed, Guardian wrote an article, then RT uh, ridiculed that article. So when you search for Swedish television mask destruction, you will not find uh, the, the original Guardian piece in the top 10 results. What you'll find is all the mentions to RT's article. So again, there was a massive story push by all these bots, by all these blog forms that actually manipulated the search rankings. So a lot of us go to Google, search for things, get the first page, we rarely go to the second or third page. So the information that is presented to us on the first page helps build our perspective or helps build our perception of what is going on of the real world event. So all these uh, are studies that I mentioned about bots, I'm going to show you just in a moment. They're all published as part of a seven volume book set that just came out last year uh, by Army University Press. Uh, so our uh, research is part of uh, the book, the book called Perceptions are Reality, Information Operations. And this was uh, released at uh, the Army um, annual conference in Washington DC, which is their biggest conference where they show all the nice uh, tanks and all the nice equipment. And there was this tiny book set there next to the big tanks. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. So anyway, so we were, we were delighted to see that our, our, our book was, our research was published in this tiny product. Anyway. Um, we are also writing a book on deviance in social media, which will be coming out by the end of this uh, semester, by the end of spring semester. And we have uh, published other books. Um, these are just two of those uh, that are highly relevant to this concept, the things that we have discussed. I'm also chairing a social cybersecurity working group where um, over 30 member institutions worldwide uh, have joined in, um, to including researchers, policymakers, journalists, and so on. You know, the goal is to create a collaborative space, to, uh, to have resources that we are working on individually and have policy briefs that can then influence decisions of funding agencies, National Academies of Sciences, uh, CRA, NSF, and so on. Basically, we need, uh, we need uh, folks, we need uh, people who are interested working in these, in these research areas to join to help uh, to help solve this problem. This is a growing problem and it's going to get uh, only worse. Um, I mentioned the tools that we have used. Some of these uh, are mentioned here. The links are here. They are part of US Department of State's program to fight foreign-based uh, foreign propaganda. And some of the cosmographers we have here. Uh, not everyone could make it to this, uh, to this photo shoot. <laughs> uh, Aside from our solutions, we also have other solutions, these crowdsource based solutions uh, who can debunk uh, fake news or debunk misinformation uh, sources. But again, these are severely limited and outnumbered by bots and troll armies and so on. So we need more uh, such solutions. Or I would rather say we need more publicly available technologies and solutions that can address this space. The social media companies need to be more proactive in uh, Reacting to the suspend, reacting to the flag content or suspending uh, accounts that are known to be uh, malicious. Uh, further, they also need to uh, take steps in making their approaches transparent. One such effort is algotransparency.org, where you try to where you can understand how YouTube is making recommendations based on what you view. We need to uh, exploit emerging technologies like blockchain for content validation, decentralized social media platforms, build collaborative networks of practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and so on. Also strengthen media literacy programs to import critical thinking skills. 
and overall need to advance our dialogue on cyber security and cyber diplomacy because we are getting into that space where there is hardly any rules and regulations so it's a complete wild west so we need to establish some some uh, some rules there how to play all this work that I presented has been supported by over 20 grants from Air Force Research Lab, Arkansas mm -hmm. Research Alliance, uh, Army Research Office, DARPA, Department of State, Homeland Security, the Monitor G Endowment, National Science Foundation, and Office of Naval Research. So with that, I'd like to conclude. And thank you all who braved this weather to be here. That's an excellent question. And um, Thank you very much. <laughs> is that a satisfactory answer? <laughs> no. All right. So, uh, so this is this is a growing problem, and this hasn't been around just for uh, the last few years. Uh, online shopping, online vendors have been there for a while, and not just um, fake reviews, but also fake votes on their up or down votes on their products by competitors, by customers. So that's, that's been a, a known issue. And there have been many studies uh, that have looked at that to try and address that problem. Amazon has a very good machine learning model that detects those fake reviews, but still there are many who just then still squeaks by and then escapes those platforms. Uh, what we have done is largely limited to publicly available information that can be collected using APIs, using uh, blog data. Amazon has very secretly and safely guarded their uh, proprietary data so they don't share unless there is a data challenge or hackathon where those publicly available data sets do emerge and then you can apply these technologies. Uh, but Amazon is very actively working on those. Although it's not of national security importance, but still it is uh, important to Amazon for uh, keeping its business clean. Uh, that's a good question. So even I don't have security clearance, so uh, they don't have to go through. Uh, so what we have done is, uh, since we are dealing with only publicly available data, so we don't have to get into any of those uh, confidential or classified research. But we are hitting a point where we would have to uh, get into a space where uh, our research is more protected and we have more uh, shields protecting us. So we have close to 30 students. Uh, they are <coughs> all from different stages of their career. They are, some of them are undergrads, some of them are in graduate program, masters, PhD, uh, also postdocs uh, who are helping us in these projects. Mm -hmm.